back to Inside the Nest. I'm Katherine Pace, and things have been heating up recently, but I don't just mean the weather. Things have been going outstanding for Montclair State Athletics from lacrosse to softball and track. But let's swing into things first with Alyssa Borzan, who's leading the NJAC with batting average, hits, runs, and on-base percentage. She's had such an awesome start to the season and landed herself a spot on the Tucci NFCA Division Three Player of the Year watch list. Borzan is the lone representative on the list for the Red Hawks, and she joins players such as Phoebe Clemens from Penn State Berks and Susan Duncan from Lancaster Bible. We'll be keeping our eyes on her position on the list as the season continues. Speaking of special achievements, after learning that her grandfather had leukemia, freshman outfielder Becky Blitz decided she needed to help. She ended up donating bone marrow that saved his life. Becky sat down with Red Hawk Sports Network to tell us more about that amazing accomplishment. Becky Blitz was 13 years old when she found out that her grandfather had leukemia and that he was in need of a bone marrow donor. Becky was eager to help. And I remember leaving school, getting so many vials of blood work done because there's so many different tests that they had to run and just, I was really nervous. There was also definitely a part of me that really wanted to do something because then it was, it was the first time in my life where I could actually do something good for a change. One day, Becky unexpectedly got the news that out of four grandchildren, she was the closest match with her grandfather. I was in history class right after lunch and then I get a call from my mom and I was like, hey, can you call me? So I leave the class and she tells me, she's like, I was the best match. The procedure is going to be over the summer, which was a couple months then or maybe a month or two, I'm not too sure. And then she just hung up the phone. And I was, I didn't go back to class, I actually went right to my counselor's office and I sat down and I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. A little over a year after she first learned of her grandfather's leukemia, it was time to donate her bone marrow. I was in the waiting room for hours. I remember I was sitting there and finally I got prepped and everything. My dad eventually came along it's actually my favorite picture of me and my dad because, of course, as my mom, she starts taking photos of everything. So I'm sitting there nervous in the hospital chair, and then she's like, click. And then there, so there's one picture of me and my dad where you could tell I'm so nervous, and he's like holding my hand, smiling. It was a lot, definitely. I could tell my body has been taking a toll. I couldn't sit up for a little bit, and then I couldn't walk myself to the bathroom. I know it's a big thing that I did. I wrote my whole college essay on it. My grandpa wrote my letter of recommendation and everything, but I just thought I was doing something nice for my grandpa, and it wasn't really that big a deal for me. Becky took some time to talk with her grandpa. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. So how did you feel when you knew you needed to have someone donate from the family? They tested the four grandchildren. And your reaction is the one that I will never forget. When you went to the nurse, let it be me, let it be me. You know, everybody else was, oh, this is great, this is wonderful, but you were, you were playing, just, you just wanted it to be you. I was young, I didn't really understand that the serious of, seriousness of it, but I was like, I get to do something and I'm not afraid <laughs> of blood, so. Yeah, that, 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 was, that was really great. How um, was the recovery for you? Um. Fortunately, that aspect of it seems to be 100%. My understanding is that you really don't get a second chance at this. It, it, uh, the longer you go without having anything going wrong, the better off you are. So the fact that I've got five years really means I've, got, I, I've passed most of the hurdles. I have to be the favorite grandchild, right? My standard answer is you have a one quarter chance of being my favorite grandchild. It became a problem when you saved my life. I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. You're going to be my great favorite grandchild for a day. So as of today, I award you the honor of being my favorite grandchild for today. I think we're good. We're getting closer and closer to the end of lacrosse season for both the men and women's. That means playoffs are near. The men's team sits in the Coastal Lacrosse Conference and the women's team sits in the New Jersey Athletic Conference. 
but before we can discuss their chances, let's see where they sit. In the NJAC, TCNJ is hanging on to the top seed with a 2-0 record, followed by Stockton, Kane, Rowan, the Red Hawks in fifth, and Ramapo at the bottom. In the CLC, Salisbury is the top dog with a 3-0 record, followed by Stockton, Christopher Newport, Montclair State in fourth with a 1-2 record, bookended by Kane and Mary Washington. Here's Charlie Badwini with his thoughts on the Red Hawks' chances. These teams may be in different conferences, but their formulas are similar. For the men, six teams in the conference, six teams make the playoffs. Top two get round one buys. On the women's side of things, the top four make the postseason. The toughest part about their situations is the number of games played. You only go against each other in your conference once, so a single loss can make a big impact on your standings. For the Red Hawks, the clock is ticking. But both the men's and women's are in position to still make the cut and keep their seasons going. For the women's team currently sitting in fifth place, they have an NJAC matchups against Ramapo, Stockton, Keene, and Rowan left on the schedule. Currently only two games back of first place, those matchups against Keene and Ramapo will be crucial as they have similar records and the teams are about the same level. If they can pick up those two wins and split against Rowan and Stockton, the Red Hawks should be in prime position to be playing in the NJAC playoffs. On the men's side, there's no doubt they will make their tournament. All six teams get a chance to make a run. If it's home field advantage they want, they're going to have to win their last two CLC matchups against Stockton and Kane. Both of those teams are very talented, and it may be a tall order for the current fourth place Red Hawks. However, picking up at least one win might be all that's needed to slip into third place, and a CLC playoff game will be seen at Sprague Field. Let's hear how student athletes feel about their NJAC schedule. From our last game that was home against Marywood, we had a 10 day break, so it was really good for us because we got to learn, a, we had a lot of practices where we got some new drills we learned, we learned some new plays, and a lot of people to get rest, so we got some key players back to our game, which was really important for us, which should be really good for our next upcoming game. I'm excited for the NJAC, it's a really competitive conference. I think it's gonna be really good. We're gonna learn every game, starting off with TCNJ, I think we're gonna learn a lot from them, and then just take it into the next game, and we'll get better every time and keep bringing the energy. We're just trying to play our best lacrosse, like every game, every week. Um, obviously, after games, we pick apart what we need to do better. Every team has to work on something and do something a little bit better. Same with us. Regardless of us opening up with TCNJ or not, it's going to be competitive. It's going to be a bloodbath, but that's what we want. We want competitive games. It really brings out the better team in us. And Jack is always competitive. It's always going to be competitive, and that's what we prepare for. These types of games are why we pick up a stick in the first place. There's still time for both the lacrosse teams to make up ground in the conference standings, as the men's team has two conference matchups remaining and the women's team has four. Plenty of runway for both teams to make a run and host some conference playoff games. And now, let's send it over to Connor Cupin with an update on the outdoor track season. Connor, what do you have for us? Thank you, Charlie. I'm here at Diogardi Field with the Montclair State track team as they gear up for the heart of their regular season. With four meets already finished, let's check in on how they've done thus far. The Red Hawks are just a little under three weeks away from NJAC championships and have gotten off to a hot start. Graduate student Anthony DeMalo is already fourth in the region in long jump, while freshman Michelle Tua won the 200 meter at the Osprey Open. All right, heading into NJAC champions, I want to play, same with regionals. Coach Carter and I have been talking about qualifying for nationals, so I'll have to hit a good mark, a top 20 mark in the nation. That's a goal for me. Yeah, for me, it's about improve myself in the block stars, in the curves. I want to improve that that speed, and also and also never give up. Even like it's hard every single time. But like um, like I say, uh, it's me against me. Sam Millevoix is the lone runner qualified so far with a 400 meter time of 49.85 seconds. Owen Fogarty has qualified in pole vault with a vault of 4.45 meters, and Jabez Thomas has qualified in triple jump with a regional top 10 jump of 13.9 meters. Long jump has two athletes, with Anthony DeMalo sporting a regional top 5 jump of 7.04 meters, and Keyshawn Dixon repping a 6.77 meter jump. John Griffith heads the whole group, as he's qualified in three events already with shot put, discus, and hammer. Shot put and discus are both regional top 10 marks, with shot put being 15.55 meters, discus being 47.02, and hammer being 50.31. Last week, April 10th, was National Siblings Day, 
a day dedicated to honoring the bonds between brothers and sisters as they grow through life together. Having a sibling is like having a built-in teammate, and teammates Gianna and Alexa Antonelli and Peter and Kayla Cosentino can attest to what it's like playing a sport with your sibling. I guess a funny story would be like her beating me in the 50 fly. Um, when I was no longer a club swimmer, I had quit club swimming. Yeah. I want to share the chicken leg story. <laughs> Go ahead, add more yeah. to the vein. So I thought it was funny if I just would throw a chicken nugget around and the cat would like run and get it. <laughs> and I threw it up in the up in the top shelf and the cat went up there and knocked a picture frame and hit her in the top of the head. And I got yelled at. Well, okay. Anyway, she younger. she beat me. She never beat me again after that. We never raced again. No, she never beat me again. We never raced again. Pretty sure we did. Hi, I'm Peter Cosentino. Hi, I'm Kayla Cosentino. I'm Gianna. I'm Alexa. This is my sister. We're related. <laughs> Growing up in an athletic family is definitely something very unique. Um, you grow up really competitive. There is a lot of expectations between both myself and my sister. Our dad pretty much coached us both when we were young and that kind of transitioned all the way up until even throughout high school, just kind of having that bond between Kayla and I going out just used to going out in the backyard to either having a catch, heading off of a tee and just training together. We were very competitive but I wouldn't really say that we were competing against each other. I saw what he was doing and I really wanted to be as good as him so I did start to train a little harder. She's my teammate more than my competition. Yeah. She's always been my teammate. We never really um, butt heads growing up, which was kind of surprising being yeah. two girls. It was very much just us against the twins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just are so close that we need to be together at all times. Yeah. <laughs> like, we need to be together at all times. So, I guess in a way, like, showing support is going to the same school I went to. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think that's how I showed the most support as a sibling in sports. <laughs> now, we go to each other's competitions. Like, I go to her swim meets, even though they're really long and it's hot in there. She mm -hmm. comes to my games. She brings her <laughs> teammates to my games. It's something really cool with an athletics, especially here, because we all support each other. I look at her stats more often than I do my own. And I remember last year when she had her first college home run, I watched like the home run repeat in class for like maybe a half hour. And I was just super happy and super stoked to see that she's playing well. And I would treat her and her performance better than I would my own. I think the best piece of advice that Gianna has given me was just to stay tough and like keep working hard. Just work as hard as you can and get as far as you can go. It's just baseball, it's just sports, like just Take it easy, take it one step at a time, and roll with it when it comes. He tells me to not put a lot of pressure on myself. That's very hard to do because this is the game of failure, and it's just very hard to keep that mindset. So just not putting pressure on yourself makes you have more fun and play better. I mean, since I'm the oldest, I have to give advice, but like, she's the youngest, so she doesn't give advice to me as much. She leads by example, and I admire her confidence. We have the best time. Yeah, especially being here with we have, your sister. Yeah, so we have the best memories, and I couldn't have asked for anything better than competing with my sister and being by her side, like, right now. Yeah. <laughs> Happy, Happy National, National Siblings Day. Day. Happy, Happy National, National Siblings, siblings Day. Day. Love your sibling. <laughs> Love your favorite sibling. That's all for this week's episode. Be sure to come back next week for another episode of Inside the Nest to catch up on the Red Hawk news. Also, keep an eye out for us on Hawk Plus to catch the men's lacrosse game at 6 o'clock Wednesday versus Stockton for the game of the week. I'm Katherine Pace, and we'll catch you next week.